I am, am talking this morning um, on part of our vision statement. Um, if you have missed a few um, weeks, we are taking a break this January from our normal way of doing things. We normally preach through books of the Bible um, and we have taken a break from that during our month of prayer this January to talk about our vision and values series as a church. Um, our vision statement as a church is to be a gospel community that's rooted in the word, that's flowing with the spirit for Newcastle and for the North East. And I'm going to say it again because we don't have like fancy visuals where you can all dwell and look at it. Um, so we are going to be, we are, we are, we're not going to be, we are a gospel community who is rooted in the word of God, who is flowing with the spirit for Newcastle and for the North East. Um, Rick spoke last week on what it means to be a gospel community. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, go online. If you look up our podcast, um, you just search the River Church Newcastle and it's on lots of places. Um, and so this week I am going to be speaking on what it means to be rooted in the word and flowing with the spirit. And I'm really, really, really passionate about this. Um, my personal experience from in utero, quite literally, till today is that God has dramatically worked in my life, supernaturally, from day one and he's totally transformed my life and then I've walked through darkness and real pain and have found deep foundations in his word that has brought me through really dark times and so I'm just really passionate about this I'm really passionate about us setting this foundation as we are just still learning to be a church we're building our culture and from day one from always we want this church to be somewhere that's rooted in the word and is flowing with the spirit it's like a non-negotiable for us um, <coughs> It is. Um, so we are going to start um, by reading a passage. So we are rooted in the word for this message. Um, <laughs> if you can go to the Psalms. Um, the Psalms is in um, the Old Testament, which just means the first bit of the Bible before Jesus came. Um, the New Testament is all the bits after Jesus came. Um, so we're going to be reading from the very start, Psalm 1. Um, so it should be easy for you to find. And Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of living water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he <laughs> prospers. I also accidentally put a bonus living water in there, so I do apologise. Um, <coughs> so um, that's what we're going to be basing our passage, our preach on this morning. Um, and I don't know the history of all of you, what kind of churches you've been in. This may be the first church you've ever been in. You may have been a Christian for a day, six months, 10 years, 20 years. Um, but depending on how long you've been around churches can depend on what your associations are with the phrase being a word church or a spirit church. And I've been in a number of different churches in my life. Um, and when I hear someone say, oh, we're a real word church, sometimes I imagine people with glasses, professors that say really long words that I don't quite understand when they preach. And I'm like, that man knows the word and he loves the word, but I don't know what you mean sometimes when you preach. Um, or maybe you've been in churches that are like, oh, we're just a spirit church and there are flags. My mum made a lot of flags in the 90s, and I, lo I love a flag. Maybe there are lots of flags, and people roll on the floor, and they laugh. And we have real associations with those words. And do you know what? I love both of those churches. I have been in churches like both of those, and both of those kinds of churches have changed me for the better and taught me about God in a way that I didn't know. But we want to meet somewhere in the middle. We want to combine the two and be somewhere that really holds the word fast and the spirit fast. <coughs> Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us that the word of God is living and active and sometimes it can be hard. I mean it might just be me but I have often approached the Bible feeling like it's kind of dry and it's kind of, I mean it is old but that doesn't mean it's not good um, and it can be hard to understand and hard to handle and it can feel quite intimidating um, and this is part of why we really really set a foundation in being a church that preaches the word of God because this has to be the foundation this has to be where we start. And it's also part of why, as a church, we preach through books of the Bible. We are in year three of working through Acts, the book. Four. Four, working through, and that's one book. 
That is one book of the Bible. Um, and we, we tend to go through a book of the Bible at a time and work through it verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And part of the reason we do that is not because we just can't think of what we could possibly base a Sunday on and it just means it's there. It's because actually the Bible is full of stuff that's easy to understand and grasp and some stuff that's really hard and complex. And part of being a church that works through verse by verse means we don't just get to preach on the bits that we find easy or that are really accessible or just yeah really understandable in our culture we have to work through the hard bits as well and that's so important because there's some really hard bits in the bible like the the first half of the bible the old testament there's stuff that looks a lot like genocide in there like there's stonings there's lots of animal sacrifices and in a church like ours in this time that just feels miles away like there's never going to be a goat sacrifice here in case anyone's wondered in fact phil introduced our first week in the building is welcome to the river church the goat sacrifice will be upstairs in half an hour um yeah i've thrown him out (coughs) um but but the we know the word of god is living and active and all of that's in here for a reason it's not in there for us to look past or to ignore all of that's in there because this is God breathes and he wants us to understand that and wrestle with that so that's part of why we preach the way we do and this passage here encourages us to look at where our teaching comes from the start of it says blessed blessed here also can mean happiness happiness is found in the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked Um, and what does the counsel of the wicked look like and when I first read this I'm immediately I picture like a glossy black table and a council of the wicked where villains <laughs> all sit around the edge stroking white cats. <laughs> the council of the wicked has come, um, which is not what it means at all. Um, the council of the wicked is just anything that teaches us that is not based on his words, that is not God breathed and God living. Um, there's a man called Derek Kidner who writes on the Psalms and he says this indicates to us part of the fact that what shapes our minds shapes our life. What we fill our minds with will flow out of us Um, And so I'd encourage you to think, like, where do you spend your time? What does fill your mind? Is it full of family and reading? Is it full of friends and TV? Is it full of social media? What is it that we spend our time consuming? And not all those things are bad. Not all those things are good. Most of them are somewhere in between. But when the rubber hits the road, when something kicks off in your life, what's your go-to? Where do you first go? And I know that mine often actually isn't the Bible, but this teaches us that that should be the first place that we go to. The culture of our world often says, look within yourself for your truth. Who are you? What do you mean? What's, what you, oh, sorry, I thought you were signaling at me again. Um, (laughs) um, Who are you? Who, like, what's your identity? You have to decide who you are. You have to know who you are and find it within yourself, the person that you are. And it's not a surprise that we're also in a big mental health crisis in our country and an epidemic of loneliness. Because when I look inside myself and I don't look at God, I see a bit of a mess. I see someone who's easily angry, who's pretty selfish and loves Instagram. You're like, like, (laughs) fundamentally, if I just focus on myself, that's what I see. And that is, that's not going to grow me into someone that looks more like Jesus. And our churches, what do the cultures in our churches look like? We've moved on quite a bit from like the fire and brimstone that used to be preached in the churches where people would declare, if you don't believe Jesus, you're going to hell and use fear to control people because that's also not what God asks of us. It's not what the Bible says. But it's so easy to fall into a culture of grace in our churches where we say, well, Jesus died on the cross for me. Yes and amen. He covers everything that I do. Yes and amen. So then does it kind of matter if I read my Bible? Do we really have to find foundations here? Because if he covers everything, then can't I just live how I want? And that's really dangerous. If we swing too far either way, it can put us in real issues. But the truth of all of it is that actually when we look at ourselves, we're not that unique. The Bible tells us that we're all born. We're all going to die and we all struggle with the same stuff that people struggle, have struggled with for thousands of years. And the Bible does also say that we are unique, that God builds us all uniquely and creates us beautifully, that he sculpts us, that he knit each of you together in your mother's wombs. But we can look to this for the foundations. When we look at ourselves and say, who am I? We can come here and it will tell us every time exactly who we are, which is children chosen by the king before the dawn of time. 
He's written our names in the book of life. And if that's something that you don't know, he welcomes all of us in. All we need to do is believe that Jesus has died for us. And we can root ourselves in his resurrection where he's cast all of our sins aside and has ascended so we can be with his Holy Spirit forever. So um, if we find unchanging truth and hope in the word, it's not easy. We can then approach this like, great, well, if this is, this is the foundations of my life, let's read it all. And if I try really hard and do a really great job, then I'll be more like Jesus. But actually, I don't know if you've ever tried just being a really good person. Or like, you know, New Year's, it's January, New Year's resolutions. Hand up in the air if you've broken your New Year's resolution yet. Yeah. We're not, we don't find it very easy to just be good and choose to be good, which is why we need to be people who are flowing in the spirit, because actually it's God that equips us to be able to live out the stuff in his word. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in and empowers us, gives us faith, gives us strength in our weakness and makes us whole where we fail because we all inevitably do. But that's the glory of the cross is that in our weakness, he is made strong. And so we, this says in Psalm 1 that we are to be like, he is like a tree planted by a stream. This is the man, blessed is the man who is not walking in the counsel of the wicked with the villains. But um, he is like a tree planted by streams of living water when he has meditated on the law day and night. And sometimes the word law here, can I, I get a bit stuck with it. The law just means instruction. Um, he has looked at the instruction of the law he, of God. He has looked at his word. He's meditated on it day and night. And he is now like a tree planted by streams of living water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. Um, and in the first half of this passage, we see someone, I don't know if you noticed this, there's a man who um, is not walking in the council of the wicked. And then it says he stands in the way of sinners and then he sits in the seat of scoffers. It becomes a very, I don't know, how do you sit? I slump when I sit. I'm like a really lazy sitter. Um, <clears throat> but the first half of this passage ends up looking really stagnant and dry. And then we are introduced to this tree, this life-giving tree that lives by streams of living water. And trees can look, trees kind of look a bit unmoving and you can't see a tree grow. I Googled this, there's bamboo that grows very fast. It can grow a metre and a half a day. Interesting. Um, but even if you stand and look at that bamboo, I'm going to imagine that we can't physically see it grow. And when we look at trees, we don't see them grow. But um, trees are anything but stagnant. And when I think of a tree, and I'm sorry this is going to make some of you feel sad, but when I think of a tree of a mighty oak, I think of the sycamore gap tree. I know. It's, but we, that tree, people were so incensed and angry when that was chopped down because it's a thing of beauty. And I think because part of us connects with that, so much of the Bible uses, talks about trees and rivers. So when I think of a tree, I think of the sycamore gap tree. And if you can imagine it in your mind, there's that dip in the skyline and it stands mighty and we'll pretend someone didn't recently drop it down. Um, and you look at that tree that has been growing for hundreds of years and stands mighty and protects and has animals in its branches. But rather than Hadrian's Wall coming over the hill, Imagine a flowing river that flows, that sustains this tree, that is rushing and bountiful and good. And one of the things about the tree that we see here, the tree that's planted by a stream of water, is that the tree is taking up nutrients from the stream here is his word, the stream here is his spirit. And when the tree takes in this water, it takes nutrients from the soil and water and it grows and it creates something brand new. It's not like a channel, like a pipe that water is carried down. When water goes into a tree, it makes something brand new. New fruit comes, something that's tangible and different from the thing that was at the start. Is nutrients built into this beautiful thing. And fruit sustains us, it's a food. But it also fertilises the soil around it. And fruit also plants new trees. That's how we get them. And this is telling us that when we live in his word and his spirit, that we're going to be fruitful and part of that fruit is multiplying like we've been talking about he will multiply and new trees will will be planted by the stream of living water that it will fertilize the soil that our life will be enriched by his word and his spirit and often when we see a tree in the bible it's to remind us of of eden and that tree that first tree that bore fruit that the tree the, the tree of life and death that um, adam and eve ate from and caused the fall of man 
And that tree is redeemed at the cross. The tree that made us fall, that we ate from because we sinfully chose to, is then redeemed at the cross when Jesus died at it. And streams of living water flowed out from that tree, from the man hung there. That tree was redeemed in that moment. We are redeemed in that moment. And the streams of living water that are eternal come and meet us in that moment. (coughs) So if we are to be changed by these streams of living water, if we are to be fruitful, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us to find ourselves flowing in the spirit, if our vision statement is that we are to be rooted in the word and flowing with the spirit, what does that mean? And I really loved Anne's um, passage from the Bible that she brought that says, let us ascend the mountain. That's the, it said the ones who are pure and holy get to ascend the mountain. You and I have found pure and holy before the Lord. Open up the gates and let the king of glory come in. And that is how we get to be rooted in the words of flowing with the spirit is that we just open up the gates we open up our hearts and the king of glory will come in as he has this morning and is going to again and the bible gives us an example of um what our church should look like being rooted and flowing um in acts 2 so acts is the book of the bible after the gospels we see matthew mark luke and john um where we talk about what jesus has done we're taught about all the things he did on earth and then acts is where the church began where the first christians were figuring it out how do we start a church and the first time we see the holy spirit come and meet is at something called pentecost um people are gathered together and the Holy Spirit comes and it's described as a wind that comes and then it's described as fire there was fire on each of their heads it says Um, and then all the people there that the Holy Spirit came and met with began speaking out in different languages Um, it says um, if I can find where I've written it down um, and at this sound a multitude came together they can hear this like hubbub this holy anarchy occurring where people are all talking in different languages that they've never spoken in before these people are Galileans they've never spoken in another language at this sound a multitude came together they were bewildered they because each one of them was hearing these people speak in their own language they were amazed and astonished saying aren't these Galileans and that is what we can expect when the spirit comes is that dramatic miracles happen. And this, this actually happened at Grace Church last year. There was um, a guy praying out that we know very well, um, who was praying out in worship, and he prayed out in a tongue, which the Bible says is a God-given language from us to him. And he, he was just praying out in tongues, out loud in the meeting, to the room, and someone brought an interpretation. Um, and at the end of the meeting, a couple from West Africa came over and said, how did you know our language? Why, how do you know our language? You were praying out in our language and this couple, I, to my understanding, were visiting the church and I don't know what was said, I wasn't given privy to that information, but this couple were astounded. This couple who aren't from this country, who had traveled to a church that hadn't been their own, to a different culture, and God picked them out in that moment and said, I see you and I know you and you are welcome here in my kingdom and in my place. Uh, this happens in our day and I just really want to raise our expectation of what God can do in our church when the spirit comes and flows and this is a normal part of the Christian life this isn't like oh we've got to hold on to these stories because we never know when the next one will come this is a normal part of our Christian life and the enemy has just knocked it out of us in the west like you go to West Africa and they don't struggle to believe that the spirit moves at all you know they yeah yeah Robin grew up there (laughs) they don't struggle to see the spirit moving but it's been knocked out of us in the west by neatness and Britishness and quietness and this is a normal part of the Christian life we can be expectant because Jesus did all these things we see him dramatically casting out demons and healing the sick and performing miracles and raising people from the dead we see that happen and it says in his word that we will do more than he does because he said I have to leave I have to ascend so that all of you can have my Holy Spirit you will do more than I do so we should be ex- have a culture of expecting the spirit to move. We should be praying in faith that he will do it. Um, I trained as um, a nurse when I left school. And I was in this church, um, a church that was full of the Holy Spirit. It was phenomenal. And I was like, right, I'm going to train as a nurse. And it's a great opportunity for me for, to pray for the dead to be raised. That is honestly was part of my thought process. I was quite a radical 18 year old, quite, yeah, sli- slightly chaotic, um, but like, but full of belief. and. I was like, I'm going to get to see dead people and I'm going to get to pray for them and Jesus is going to raise them from the dead. Great. And people were like, 
Sure. Yeah, we, we can pray that you'll see that happen. <laughs> um, but it's so easy, isn't it, as we get older, to have that knocked out of us. We pray for stuff and we see stuff not happen and we think, really, should I, should I keep bothering? Is this, am I going to discourage them? Am I going to get discouraged? But don't be discouraged or set your sights low. 1 Corinthians 12 says, To each of us is given the Holy Spirit, a manifestation of the Spirit, for the common good. Sometimes we approach the Spirit like, oh, it's for me to experience in this moment. And that's beautiful and we do when we learn more about God for ourselves. But the Holy Spirit has come for the common good. And it lists all the gifts that the Spirit gives us. And it says to each of us is given this. Not to some of you I give this. It says each of you is given a gift that the Holy Spirit um, gives different ones to different people. It appoints them and gives different measures. But it says things like wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, healings miracles, prophecies, tongues and interpretation. All of this is a gift for all of us. There's not some of us that get in and some of us that don't. And we definitely are not seeing what the early church has yet in our church here. Um, but part of our belief that this is for now is why we do contribution-led worship, why we currently don't have instruments, which we are going to bring in soon, for those that have been waiting <laughs> with bated breath. Um, and also, we love, we're both musicians. We really love music. We've not done this because we think a cappella worship is the way to go. But, um, <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, but we've done this because we fundamentally believe before anything else, we have to have a foundation where we seek the Holy Spirit in our meetings, where the one who leads the room is the Holy Spirit. So often, uh, I don't know if people know this or not, but uh, different worship leaders work different ways. But if I'm leading worship, for example, I will prepare one or two songs and then the rest I leave and wait to see what happens in the meeting. So if people are praying out about mountaintops or about God reigning, then we're gonna sing something in response to that. We want our worship to be dynamic and changing depending on what God is doing. We wanna just follow where he leads because without him, it's all for naught. Um, and <coughs> I was in a church meeting um, against my will, I might add, um, when, <coughs> um, when, I, when I was a teenager and and this is, this is some of the reasons I so fundamentally believe this is essential. Um, I was in a church meeting, which I was only at because my friend had said to me, if you come to church with me now, I'll never ask you again. And I was like, amen, I will come to your church. So I never have to step foot in a church building again as long as I live. I, I did grow up in a Christian home, but I experienced some real pain and hurt from the church. I was... I was treated wrongly and I put all of that onto God and said, well, if the church treats me badly, then so do you, Lord, and I want nothing to do with you. And I shoved him in a bin and I did my own merry thing and I wasn't in church for about a year. And then my friend got baptised and told me essentially to stop being selfish and come to her baptism and think of someone else other than myself. Great wisdom. She's a wonderful woman, my friend Zoe. Um, and I went to this church and I was absolutely livid and cross in that room and there was worship and there was a baptism and a preach and I was like get me out of this place you're all nuts um and um I was sat there at the end intentionally not speaking to anybody um and a man walked up to me who I'd never met I'd never stepped foot in this church before and he said to me I saw you walk in our door today and as you walked past I saw arrows and daggers sticking out of your back he said you have been hurt by the church People who should have loved you well have failed you and have injured you. And God asked me to come and speak to you today to beg for your forgiveness. He said, I'm sorry for what the church has done. God says this was never his plan for you. Those people that hurt you do not represent him in his kingdom. And I've come to beg for your forgiveness for what's been done. And often when we get wronged by people, we don't get the sorry, do we? Like 95% of the time, unless it's my children and I'm enforcing them to apologise to each other, we don't get the sorry. And I cannot tell you the work it did in my heart to hear someone apologise for the pain that I had been carrying and the rage that I had been carrying. And that moment utterly transformed my life. And I actually ran into that man about six months ago. He was coming to train people on the prophetic. And and I, um, I'd, I'd shared that with someone else um, a few months before. I go to a leadership training once a month. And I was able to share with him. I said, because of, the, because of what you've done, I'm here today. Part of his fruit from his life for living in the word and flowing in the spirit 
is me. I'm part of his fruit. And I said, I'm, I'm now helping lead a church in Newcastle and a church plant because of what you did. And I, God's always on our case. I don't know what would have happened if he hadn't done that. But I was so far from the Lord and so angry and it transformed my life. And I went back to church week after week and I was still fairly cross and I really hate worship. But I got there in the end. <laughs> but God is full of grace and kindness and he meets us where we're at. He meets us in our pain and our mess. And he says, come in just as you are. I will do the rest. Um, and recently, like you might think, well, that's a very dramatic way for God to speak to you. And it is. Um, but what does it mean for us to hear God? What does it mean for us to hear him in our meetings? You might hear someone pray out. You might hear someone bring a word. You might hear someone say, oh, I have a picture. And you're like, what does that mean? People say this stuff all the time. And it looks really differently for different people. And one of the things that I think trips us up is worship here. Sometimes we can mix up spontaneous and spirit filled. So when someone brings something here, that doesn't necessarily mean God first spoke to them about it here. Sometimes someone, God will have been reminding someone of something for weeks. Like you keep going to read your Bible and he's like, read this passage, go on. You just hear that little whisper, that little nudge. Or you've dreamt about something. There are people in this room that dream dreams and will regularly dream dreams again and again. And then one Sunday or one conversation with someone, someone will bring something up and God will say, that's it. And that's when they bring it. There are people here that write poetry and God speaks to them through their poetry and speaks to others through their poetry. I was once given a prophetic cake and honestly, more Lord, <laughs> like, <laughs> they brought me a cake and it had this pattern on it in stars and she gave me an A4 page and said, this is what all the colours mean, this is what God says about you, this is, and I then got to eat it and like, <laughs> honestly, great, that was in that same church, like, glory, it was glorious. Um, and speaking from my own experience, the way that sometimes God has spoken to me, sometimes I will suddenly experience a pain that I don't normally experience. And sometimes that's God saying to me, someone in here is in pain in that place. Like I'll have an ache or a pain in my knee. And I think, oh, that's God saying someone here is in pain. And to bring that, sometimes it is a picture that pops into my head. I was praying for someone recently after church and a scene from Harry Potter popped into my head. And I was like, is that you, Lord? I mean, like... <laughs> There's wizards and witchcraft. I was like, I can't bring this here. But I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to give it a punt. And one of the things um, about prophecy and words of knowledge is that the Bible says we know in part. We don't know the whole thing. We don't know what God will do with it. And, you know, sometimes we don't know if we're getting it right or wrong. But a great way to start when you say these things is, I think God could be saying, not the Lord saith to you, because that gives no bigger room. And the, the Bible says we have to give things to people and then they weigh them. They think about them, they pray them. Is that for me or is it not? Because we're not always going to get this right. And we want to build a culture here of giving stuff a punt and it's fine to get it wrong. So Harry Potter popped into my head when I was praying for someone. I was like, sure, I'm just going to pray this out. And then um, prayed this scene of Harry Potter over this person and felt a bit like, well, I think I vocalised. Oh, you can just, you don't have to take any of this on. You just put this in the bin it's no I'm just going to pray it because I feel like I should because it popped into my head and that's how God speaks to me but feel free to ignore this and the person said that scene you just described I bought as a print last week and it's just been delivered to my house and, and thank you for praying that and and in a moment where I felt like a bit of a prat and was like what's the theology of witchcraft <laughs> whilst I'm trying to pray for someone actually the more important thing is that God said to that person I see you I value you, I know you, I am an infinite God who holds the universe in his hands and in this moment I see you and I'm for you and I want to speak to you, that I care about your day to day, I care that you love Harry Potter. That's what the Lord said and that's important because he knows each of us and he loves us. So that's how I hear God but it's all, everyone hears him so differently and it's part of why we shouldn't fear the quiet and the space. One thing that we're really excellent at is asking God to speak and then we kind of never wait because we really hate it. We're like, Lord, come and speak. And then if I'm leading worship, I, I often count down from 30 to enforce myself not to speak again because I hate being at the front and there being lots of silence. But actually, if we ask God to speak but are too busy to ever stop and listen, when are we going to hear him? Like, li listening is an active thing. Such a, in the same way that speaking is an active thing, we have to stop 
and we have to listen. Also, whenever we are given a gift, so when we are learning a skill, we have to learn and train. Like sprinters, do, I, I'm not athletic. I'm going to presume sprinters don't sprint and they're just as fast as they're ever going to be the first time. Um, I feel like people like Usain Bolt have trained a lot for a long time. Um, and it's the same with spiritual gifts. God gives us these gifts. God plants a seed. He takes that fruit and plants it. And one of our jobs is to nurture it and to feed it. And God will grow it. We can't work this stuff up. We can't decide that we're going to be prophetic and work it up and shout a lot or put on the right songs or sing in E minor, the holy key, and <clears throat> then have God come and speak. He will do the work. We can't work this up. There's no point us faking it. But what we can do is create a culture of expectancy where we say, God, come in. We want to meet with you. Say to him, God, I want you to speak to me. I want to, I want to uplift Anne, Lynn, Brian. God, what can you say for them today from me. And like one of my friends who is very prophetic, he says whenever he prays, he asks God for, to come and speak. And the first thing that he sees, he sees a picture of badgers eating jam. It's just what he does every time. And he's like, I know I have to push past it. And the, I don't know why the badgers and the jam are a thing for him, but they are. But he has to really push past it and, say, and go deeper in. And we have to wait. And it doesn't always happen in the moment. We can pray for people in the week and then speak to them on a Sunday and pray for them. You know, it doesn't have to be spontaneous. Um, and the great thing about this is that it speaks to the world around us. When God moves supernaturally, it speaks to people. When people in the Bible and people in the Gospels saw the miracles that Jesus did, they were astounded. Hundreds of people came to faith. And I'm gonna share another story about my life to encourage you, but um, we, um, we were told on multiple occasions, in fact, that we would never have children. Um, I used to have a brain tumour. Um, I had a brain haemorrhage and we were told by doctors that we would never conceive. The, the part of my brain that was injured by my haemorrhage and my tumour meant that we'd never have children. And you may have noticed, they're quite loud. Um, we have three of them. And my testimony actually is that God came in utterly miraculously we have we have letters from doctors we have conversations from doctors that say our eldest child is impossible she's medically impossible and entirely miraculous we had a consultant and i used to be a nurse they don't band around the word miracle they often are very cynical um, and we had a conversation with a doctor who walked into a room and said hi so you're the miracle everyone's talking about and we have a child that god placed in me through his power not through anything I've done, but came and worked a huge miracle in our life and did it again a couple of years later and then did it again a couple of years later because he is so faithful and good. And that testimony speaks to people around me. Like I get to speak to mums on the yard and tell them about my impossible children and about a God who works. And we don't always see a direct line between people being healed. Like God can heal people that aren't Christians. I've prayed for people when I was in this church that was really, really spirit-filled and going for it. We just used to see healings all the time. They, the year I was there, they had a magnet that we all stuck on our fridges that said, I think we want, we want to see, we want 20 home groups. And this year we're going to see 30 healings on the streets. That's what we believe. We're going to go for it. We're going to petition God. We're going to really believe him for it. And they've been praying for five years for, for God to do signs and wonders in their church. And the year that I was there, they saw 300 people healed on the streets. God like blew that up. He came in and there was just, and this is why I was like, I'm going to see the dead raised, sure. Um, <laughs> because you, people just got healed. Like, I was at a youth I was at a youth event once as a youth leader and some kids were being gross and throwing around urinal cakes, which if you don't know what they are, praise the Lord that you... <laughs> Don't ask, don't Google them, gross. Um, but these kids are flinging around this horrible stuff from the toilets. And then they said, oh, someone said, I think there's a, a, someone in here who's got pain in their right arm and God wants to heal it. And this girl was like, you all right then? Go on then, love, come and pray for me. I was like, sure, well, he'll heal you, so fine. And I prayed for this girl who was maybe 15 and had zero faith that, for any of it. And I prayed for her and she'd been in pain and was struggling with exams at school. And she started screaming. And was like, the pain is gone, the pain is gone. I was like, yeah, I know. That's how it works. Like, I don't know. I just had a real, real simple understanding that God would just come and move. And um, I don't know what happened to her. She came and talked to some of the youth leaders. Um, and I don't know if, there's a, if she became a Christian or not. But I know that something happened in that girl's life that she won't forget. And we can plant the seeds, but we don't know what God does with the rest. 
but it's our job to just nurture this stuff, to have a culture of expectancy here where we believe God will come in. Um, and I also recognise when I'm talking about this, that some of you will hear this and it will really hurt. Some of you will have had prayer for healing tens, hundreds of times. I have chronic back pain that I have to take strong painkillers for fairly regularly. I have asthma. I was up coughing, not sleeping till half four in the morning this morning because my asthma was out of control. And I don't know why God would heal me of a brain tumour, but not of back pain and asthma. I don't know. But it's really painful when this stuff happens. And we don't know. God doesn't tell us exactly in the word why we don't see people healed. What he does tell us for certain is that one day all of us will be without pain, without hurt, without tear, without sadness. One day we will all be fully restored and not sick. But what he doesn't tell us is which side of heaven that lands on for all of us. And there's different things in the Bible that talk about different people and challenges they had with being healed. But nowhere in the Bible does it specifically say, if you've not been healed, it's because of this, this or this. That's not in his word. So one of the things we need to be really careful of, actually, is praying for people well, for not discouraging them and not putting ba ba boundaries, that's not the word, barriers, and not putting barriers before them. And you're like, oh no, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? Um, well, actually, um, 1 Corinthians 14 tells us how we can do that well how we can minister well in spiritual gifts. And this is a passage that you'll have heard a lot. It's actually one that is often um, said at weddings. Um, you know, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable, resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, that is about spiritual gifts. That's not about marriages. I mean, we all need that in, in marriages, if you're married. But um, that is speaking about spiritual gifts and how we should minister in spiritual gifts. When we approach someone with a word, when we bring something in church, it should start from a place of love. If someone has peed you off in church, or you've heard someone gossiping, this is not a time that you get to share your opinion with someone under the guise of being spiritual. That is not what this is for. That's actually entirely contradictory to the Bible. And I'd suggest if you want to pray for someone and you've got some bitterness in your heart, you need to deal with your heart before you do anything else. We are to love people first and foremost. So when we bring things in church, when we pray out, when we bring prophecies or words of knowledge to one another, the first thing it should be is encouraging and it should be biblically based. If what you're praying is contradictory to something in the Bible, then it's not from the Lord. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to know your whole Bible inside out. But if you're saying, oh, if you work really hard, Jesus will love you. That's just not true. And um, that's not what he says. So it should be biblically based. It should be encouraging. And the Bible says also it should bring comfort. That is what this stuff is for, to, for the common good, to point our eyes to Jesus to show us him every time that he knows us, he sees us and he loves us. That's what it's for. And I know some of you will be sitting there thinking, but I have heard when people have brought prophetic things that speak of something negative happening in someone's life. And yes, it's true that God does that. I, I've known it. We, the man actually who led the church I used to be at, he once got in the front of a taxi with someone and God said to him, tell that man that God knows he's having an affair. And he was like, no, Lord no no i won't and he was like simon i mean i don't know if he said it in a booming voice but um simon said he felt very clearly say tell that man i know he's having an affair and so which he did and he said the tra taxi driver nearly crashed his car he said i really should have said it when we were stationed <laughs> but you live and learn um, um and um and he was like how do you know how no one knows and he's like actually god is God has said this to you and I wanted to bring it because he has more for you than this. There's hope for you. But Simon is a man who's been leading churches and working in the spirit for decades and decades. If you ever feel like God is saying something to someone in church that's going to be challenging or negative, for one, you need to really, 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 really know. You need to have a history of getting this stuff right because all of this takes practice. Prophetic takes practice. We listen to God, we're going to get it wrong. It takes practice. 
Also, it should never be done alone. So Sunday spaces are never a place to go up to someone and say, I think God says this secret sin about you. And if you're here thinking, oh my goodness me, what if God tells people things about me? This is not the primary way God operates at all. In his word, he is a God of grace and mercy and love. And that's how Jesus operates in the, in the gospels. But if you think God has said something to someone, that you've got something that's negative, come and speak to someone who is in pastoral care. So one of the leaders of the church, because sometimes God does say this stuff, but what we need to do is make sure we're loving and caring for people really well. So if you ever think something like that is, that you've had a word like that, come and speak to Rick or to me, um, and we will weigh it together and decide if that's gonna be brought to someone. And actually sometimes God says things to us that are just for us. So I think more often than not, when I hear something prophetic, it's the Lord pinning something in my own heart, not in someone else's. You know, it's not always for someone else. But um, so I just want to say that make sure you don't ever do that. Come and chat to one of us and never do this stuff alone. Um, if you have something to say to people, it's good to do it in pairs. We work in teams. But um, fundamentally, this morning, what I really believe is that the King of Glory is going to come in this morning. The King of Glory who heals brain tumours, who makes the blind see and the lame walk, who does raise people from the dead. That's the same King of Glory that we worship this morning. And we want to be a church that sees the fruit of this stuff in our community. Amen? We want to be a people who pray and who believe God's word and we see fruit in our community. We want to see new trees planted here because we faithfully believe his word and we pray for signs and wonders, for supernatural things to happen. Um, we believe in a God that is everlasting has everlasting streams of water and the end of psalm 1 verse 3 says um he is a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither in all that he does he prospers and that withering is not about seasons but it's about this sustaining power that always comes this isn't something that ebbs and flows but he always sustains all things